okay? And I have your permission. If you don't want to be recorded, um, we'll have Jack edit you out. And it does say recording. So now, Martin, here you go. Um, and you are now the host. All right. And there's no waiting room. So uh, people will just come in automatically. Well, uh, Rob, I thought that you handled it very nicely uh, when you <laughs> didn't have your notes for a portion of the service. Um, a, a, as as Mandy so carefully pointed out, I was among friends. Uh, and B, since I had, had uh, been telling people I was going to uh, extemporize, it was karma. So I was ready for it. Um, and as it, it made a nice tidy, it was for a nice tidy meditation. Uh, we discussed that in Bible study as well on Saturday morning. There, there are a lot of, of you know, good, good opinions uh, that get shared on Saturday morning from the, the likes of Bob Keen and Tom Wilson and Jay Benson and Dave Amen and a few others. So anyway, I was bragging that I do it Saturday morning. Plus the fact that you write your chat, your sermons late in the week doesn't hurt to, to know what you're talking about. Um, it actually it actually helps a lot because you know you're, Martin and I are both aware of sometimes current events can uh, can take you now you can always make up for it in the pastoral prayer. Uh, <laughs> but as a matter of fact, I, I chose to write this meditation on Saturday afternoon. Um, but I always get it done Saturday uh, afternoon in time for my editor to uh, take it and and really get over it uh, in a pretty detailed way. My editor did a superb job this weekend. Uh, and my editor was uh, either singing alto or soprano today. I forget which one. Um, but, uh, Deborah, Deborah is my... Uh, is my uh, editor in chief, and she does an adept job at uh, reminding me what my voice is. Hi, Susan. How are you? Tom, good. Joan, good. good to see you all. Michael, so glad you're back again. This is wonderful. We'll wait a couple more minutes, I think, um, and then dive in. Say it down. And we do uh, encourage you to mute after you get settled in uh, so we don't record your background conversations. Um, always feel free to unmute to ask questions and join in. We have a very good history over these first three weeks of everyone getting their voice heard and no one getting their voice heard too much. It's been perfect. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Good to see you. Hi. Sorry, it took me a while to get on. I don't know why the link was slow. Well, <clears throat> but here I am. Here good you to are. see you all. And there was no waiting room, was there? No. Okay, good. Good. I think that's been an improvement the last two weeks. Yeah. We don't have to fill. We'll, we'll be uh, going in just a second. We are recording. Um, and we're going to let Jack work his magic for us again. Uh, he's been so superlative. Uh, mm -hmm.
Rob, we're happy you, you uh, found page three of your sermon. Yes, you did a good job. So hold on one second, Bob. So, so uh, Rob, this is Bob Keen on the phone with me. Yep. Um, and he said the, the link that he has is last week's. And I, I said it was the CCDC News. I'll, I'll send him the link. Martin, okay. tell, tell uh, Bob so I'll, I'll email him the link. Okay. And to Jesse as well. And to Jesse as well. Easy, okay. Easily done. Okay, very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Martin, through the magic of modern uh, Zoom page uh, concierge service, I've uh, copied and emailed the link to them. Um, they're both very adept, so I expect they'll be uh, on uh, by 4.05, and we can commence right on time. <laughs> yeah. Zoom time. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, Zoom saving time. There he is. Look at that. All right. Well, um, great. Great to see you, Bob. Glad you're here, Bob. I expect Jesse <coughs> to uh, follow shortly. Thank you. I never got your email. Uh, this worked out perfectly. Uh, the uh, two-headed monster hosting this has worked very well, but uh, we're in time. Uh, you're just in time for us to start. So Martin, go ahead. Thank you, and welcome everybody from far and wide. I'm I'm uh, coming to you from Cambridge. It just happened to be that all these Sundays I've I've been in Cambridge, um, but grateful to be with you in this in this way. This is reading the Bible with Rembrandt. If that, that's not what you where you intended to be, you you can cut off now. But uh, uh, this is the fourth of four sessions on uh, on Rembrandt and the Bible. The first session, if you missed it, uh, or to remind you, was uh, Rembrandt's interpretation of some Hebrew Bible passages. Uh, the second was uh, Rembrandt self-portraits and particular focus on embedded self-portraits, that is where he put himself in the biblical scene. Uh, then last week we looked at uh, uh, his depictions of Jesus and particularly the, the face of Jesus. And today we're going to immerse ourselves in the uh, Holy Week story. Since this is our last one, Holy Week is coming up in uh, what a couple of weeks, and it's really rich material for uh, Rembrandt. And so we're going we're to look at a, a, a quite a number of, of of works, more than we have in previous uh, sessions. Um, but first, I want to uh, say some more general words before we get to looking at Rembrandt's uh, work. Um, much of this you will know by way of reminder. Some of it may be um, helpful and new for you. So uh, as you know, there are four uh, gospels, four stories of uh, Jesus. The first three, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, are what's called the synoptic gospels. That's S-Y-N, optic, uh, as in synonym, um, meaning the same, so the 
uh, synonym synoptic the same view they largely tell the same story now there are variations as we'll see but those three uh, working from common sources and common traditions are largely uh, the same and then the gospel of john is a, something of an outlier he's got a lot of stories that aren't told in the other gospels which uh, uh, enrich our understanding of who uh, jesus was and is um, and it's interesting that the, the ways in which they differ, and we'll, again, we'll look at some of those differences, that the folks who were compiling uh, the canon uh, of uh, scripture did not make any attempt to harmonize them. In other words, they were, they were uh, um, obviously comfortable with some of the differences and maybe even thought the differences were instructive and helpful uh, um, among the accounts. Uh, one theologian has, has made the point that, that the fact that they had four Gospels that were different and yet no attempt to harmonize them was an, an early expression and plea for nonviolence. That leaving room for different interpretations, leaving room for different understandings of this common story and, uh, and, and, and we often get them all kind of mixed up in, in our own minds, much as we do with the creation accounts in Genesis. If I've, I've, many times I've asked people starting out in a scripture study, uh, wh wh uh, what do you remember about the creation account? And, and, and people will throw in Adam and Eve and they'll throw in the seven days. And those are actually from two different stories, <laughs> entirely different stories in first Genesis and second uh, Genesis. And uh, the idea of laying one story right next to another and not attempting to harmonize them or reconcile them is itself is self uh, Ancient peoples were not stupid. They knew there were differences. And it was because they believed that uh, different perspectives help, uh, help us understand the story and uh, much as you need two eyes to see something in perspective and in dimensions. Um, so, um, but there were some basic things in which the gospel writers agreed related to the, uh, the, the uh, Holy Week story, uh, agreed that Jesus was crucified and buried and raised and that this was an event or a series of events that was of enormous significance, not just for Jesus, but for everyone. And so this was an underlying kind of theme that is attested to by all four of the gospel writers, um, that Jesus appeared before Pilate, uh, the, the Roman governor, and that the people were offered a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. That's all the gospel readers uh, writers have that. Uh, that Joseph of Arimathea was uh, the one who paid for the funeral and, uh, and the burial. And uh, he's, he's frequently depicted in Rembrandt's work, as we saw and we'll see again today. Uh, that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. In all four Gospels, it's Mary Magdalene that, uh, that is, it goes to the tomb uh, to find it empty and encounters Jesus. And uh, the difference, though, among the gospel accounts is sometimes Mary's accompanied by others. Uh, so uh, in Matthew, it's Mary Magdalene and someone described as the other Mary. In Mark, it's Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus and Salome. And in Luke, it's Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James and other women un unnamed. And then in John is just Mary Magdalene on her own. So, you know, there, there, are, there are differences, but she is uh, a constant. And by the way, consistent as well that it's women that were the first to uh, <laughs> encounter the risen Christ. And uh, that in itself is quite a statement because women in, in that society were um, uh, considered of a second uh, class, as it were. Um, and <clears throat> here they're given the most prominent role and and great privilege of being the ones to to first witness the risen Christ. So now there's some there is some uh, and we'll see some depictions here today of Judas. Um, you know the thirty pieces of silver. That's only in Matthew. Uh, the so-called doubting Thomas story is only 
in John. The road to Emmaus story is only in Luke. Now, that's not to discount those stories at all, but just to, to note that uh, they're, they're found uh, in a single uh, gospel. Um, the Last Supper is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Again, synoptic, largely the same viewpoint. And John, there's no Last Supper, or at least not uh, the as as we would uh, know it. But there, um, but in its place, as it were, in the narrative, was the washing of the disciples' feet, uh, foot washing. And and in some traditions, uh, by the way, like in the Mennonite tradition, uh, the washing of, of feet is elevated to to a sacrament. Uh, or or, sac uh, or sacrament like um, <clears throat> in those in those uh, traditions. Now, then, the uh, gospel writers have different descriptions of what this resurrection is uh, is like, and and this is uh, this is a really it takes us into the the realms of kind of uh, uh, the mysterious, but. They are given the unenviable task of trying to describe something that is finally indescribable, <laughs> the gospel writers are. And so they reach for words and images that are in some ways paradoxical. Uh, you know, paradox is where you hold two things in tension and, and that will always be in tension. They cannot be reconciled or brought into some, uh, you, like, like holding two uh, ends of a magnet, and, and yet they belong together. <laughs> Uh, and so, for instance, in John's, uh, and, and, and I would say that the, the part of what the challenge of what they're describing is, what was this event? What, 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 uh, what was it like? <laughs> what happened? Uh, and, and what was, what was, uh, what was the risen Christ? How would you, would you describe him? Um, is it a spiritual reality or is it a, corporeal reality that is a bodily reality and, and 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 so they describe this event in all sorts of ways that seem hard to to hold together so for instance in in john's gospel uh jesus goes to the disciples who are who are hiding out behind closed doors he just comes you know it's like comes through the, i mean literally through the door uh not the doorway but the door um which uh, enough that they were the disciples were concerned that they were seeing a ghost, uh, and yet at the same time, this is where the encounter with Thomas takes place, and this very physical, real, you know, showing the the wounds, um, and uh, and Jesus inviting him to put his hand where the wounds are. So that in in Luke, uh, after the Emmaus meal, it says that uh, that Jesus. Uh, of the risen Christ disappeared. Just, I mean, just like poof, disappeared. And, and we'll see one of uh, Rembrandt tries to depict that moment. Um, and yet, the, also in Luke, the, the risen Christ, uh, when when he when they question whether whether they're seeing an apparition of some kind, he, he, he says uh, he asks the wonderful question: Do you have anything to eat? <laughs> I mean, I, I just love that question. It seems so so in Congress. Do you have anything to eat? And uh, uh, and in part, you say, well, I guess this being raised sure builds up an appetite, <laughs> you know, and cut any, um, but also it's, it's a way of, of stressing that, that, that this is, a, a, a something real or someone real, uh, it's, it, uh, not, not a ghost. I mean, ghosts don't need to eat. And, uh, um, so you have, you have something to eat. Um, I, I remember just, <clears throat> Little, little mini aside in reading this book about children's views of of God and what God was like and and wonderfully charming interviews by these little um, British children and I remember one was, said I think God floats behind a cloud to eat sausages sometimes <laughs> I, you know just you know very charming I think but but the point I think is it's a way of saying God is real right if God uh, can eat sausages sometime. The closest I think in scripture that anyone came to really describing uh, this um, reality is, is the apostle Paul who talked about our um, Jesus was raised and we're raised with a spiritual body. 
Now that's that's that in itself is kind of a paradox, a spiritual body. Uh, a body in the sense of, you know, because Paul could not imagine what it would be like to be have, have personhood apart from a body. Now, uh, uh, but a different kind of body than we're used to talking about. So it's a spiritual body, um, which again, is, uh, it's meant to be hard to imagine uh, what, what, that, what that is, but it's, it's a way of affirming personhood and yet in a different way than we know it in this life. Um, so uh, let's, 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 uh, uh, do you have any questions or, uh, about that or what I'm said thus far? Okay, what I'd like to do now, I'm gonna share my screen and see if I can do this. There we go. Uh, are, are you seeing this uh, title page here as it were? Oh, not yet. I'm sorry. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Just give me one second, folks. I was here. You know. Yeah, and then do um, do the slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Let me see what I see. Sorry, folks. Let's. Uh, um, my technical assistant, who also happens to be my wife, Karen. <laughs> just, Helping me with this. Hold on a sec. I, I think I didn't share the screen. Go back. I did just share the screen. Let me escape first. Let me escape. Okay, go back to Zoom. Zoom. Okay, go up to here. Okay. Over here. Got down here. Yeah. Do that. Ah, yeah, close that. Share screen. Okay, do that. And this. Yeah. That's where we are now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Got it. Got it. All right. Yeah. Still got it. Even better. All right. Ready very go. good. So thank you for your patience. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do here is um, take a moment to go through these slides and and without making any con or any of us making any comments. I'd like to just let the works um, speak for themselves first, and then, and then we're going to go back over this over them again, and we'll have a chance to react and respond. And in fact, uh, after I go through them in, in, in some silence, I'm going to dwell on some of these at least for oh, like 15 seconds or something, so you can really reflect on what you're seeing. Um, and then again, we're going to go back over them, so you'll you'll uh, we'll we'll look at each one individually in more depth. Uh, there's one I'm going to skip over very quickly in this silent portion because it's uh, the raising of Lazarus, and I'm 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 going to uh, address that only when we get to the time of looking at the individual slides. Okay, so um, again, I'm we're, let's enter a, a time of of silent kind of meditation and reflection on these on these uh, these works.
Okay, some of those you may not even recognize what the scene is. Um, and I apologize for the quality of some of these reproductions. Um, but before we go, before we look at each one of these individually, any, any kind of general comments you wanna share in seeing the sweep of these uh, of works and all of their variety and the different scenes that are depicted? They each seem to have to have some sort of high priest in them, some official with a great big headpiece in them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what, we'll look at, what is that supposed to depict? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. I think it's different in, in different instances. So I'm not sure I could generalize on that, but we'll, we'll look at that. Um, Martin, was Rembrandt an, a religious person? Do you know? Yeah, he clearly was. I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned in the um, first session, perhaps, that one of the most remarkable things is how many drawings he did. Yeah. Were not for for public consumption. It was more like a visual diary um, or, or like a spiritual diary. Um, he, he would draw these scenes from the Bible. He was not a conventionally churchy guy. And in fact, I, uh, I gather he was kind of condemned by the church because he, after his first wife died, he uh, uh, had a, a sort of common law marriage with his former maid. And uh, so he, um, so, so he was not, uh, but, and his, and his la the only possession he had when he died was, a, was his Bible. And so those are all kinds of indications. And, 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 and I, I don't think I'd need to know any of that uh, to, to know the, because he, he engages these stories on such a personal level. Uh, it's, 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 um, it's not something that's just an academic interest. Mm -hmm. True. There's all of these, there's so many people. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not one or two people. It's, it's a host of people within. You mean depicted here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and certainly in, 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 in this crowd, a crowd of people at the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's look at this first one here. Um, this is obviously Jesus uh, overturning the money changers' tables, which is uh, um, an early Holy Week story when he comes to Jerusalem and is horrified by what he sees there. Uh, notice a couple things. This is this is like a halo, right? You've seen this in other other the uh, doxa or glory of God depicted in this these uh, kinds of um, rays. But notice it's not over Jesus' head in this case; it's over his hand. Jesus' hand. That uh, it, which is which is uh, I, I think Rembrandt's way of saying you know he is uh, about holy work here uh, by this act of, of, uh, of um, uh, dismissing the, the money changers from oh, the money. temple. Uh, but this, this is a very dynamic. This, this such here, the, it, it's, uh, it has such tension to it. And, and then up here, Bob, to your point about who, who's, who's got the turban or whatever this headdress is, uh, the, these are the, the the scribes and the Pharisees who are the keepers of the religious order. That are obviously standing aback, and there's and there's not. It's a kind of a I don't know the way I would say is it, they're, they're removed some, um, but they're all, which is I think a way of saying that that they they uh, as keepers of tradition, the danger is always to be. Um, static. Now, I'll move on here. Now, th this is an example of a, a drawing. That, again, picture Rembrandt was just doing this. This is not a, sometimes he did drawings as studies for other works of art. Uh, but, but in this instance, there, there's no, there's no painting or etching. It was just, it was Rembrandt reflecting on uh, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and and uh, and and Peter is always depicted with a beard. 
Um, but this this idea, this humble act of washing people's feet, which I mentioned is in John's gospel only, uh, and uh, it, it really it, it stands in the place of, of the, the tradition of the Last Supper. Let's all remember to mute. Thank you. Yes, and, and this, this is, uh, the Last Supper was not a particular focus for uh, Rembrandt's work. This is another drawing and it's of Leonardo da Vinci's famous Last Supper. Um, and in the, this, the groupings of the four, four groups is very much uh, on the lines of what uh, da, da Vinci did. And just to remind you that Rembrandt came a hundred, uh, I mean, a century after da Vinci, but obviously was um, inspired by his work. Uh, yeah, this is, of course, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, where, where he's uh, despairing and, and said, let this cup pass from me and ministered to by the angel. <laughs> Can anyone figure out what this one is? Another, another drawing, what, what, what scene that depicts? Could you not stay awake with me? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. Peter, James, and John we wouldn't stay awake. And, and you could, it, here, here, Jesus seems to, it's a kind of imploring gesture, isn't it? You know, why? You know, um, and I can't tell whether this figure is still asleep or is hanging his head in, in uh, shame. But this one, it's, and I'm sorry, you can't see it in this reproduction too well, but his face is, is, he's got his hand under his chin and he's like, he's thinking about, about uh, what, what Jesus is saying. And, and the idea of, of depicting Jerusalem in the, in the, in the background. Another drawing, there's a lot going on here. You've got, uh, the, this is obviously the arrest of Jesus and they, they came with the, the swords and the spear and this commotion over here to the lower right is, is uh, likely, uh, it's like Peter, is Peter who is wanting to resist, I mean, uh, violently resist, cut off the uh, centurion's ear and he's being um, sort of held and, but there's that there's that, uh, uh, that 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 violent corner here, and yet Jesus um, really commands center stage here, even though he's in a vulnerable position with a spear toward him. It it, uh, it it's like he's large and in charge. And here again, there's that doxa, that visible glory. Um, Wow, this is this is uh, the scene of Judas returning the thirty pieces of silver. You see, there's the silver. Here's Judas. Here again are the are the uh, the religious leaders, Bob with with their fancy headdresses. What I what I um, love about this is the posture of the various figures. So first, look at Judas. Um, he's got torn clothes. He's got his hair is kind of all disheveled. His hands, one person described them as, as so tightly clenched that almost like they would uh, start bleeding. I mean, and it's that, that, that painful remorse. Um, and, and his um, contorted, I would say, and, and this also reminded me a little bit of the prodigal son depiction where, where the, he had fine clothes, but they were um, torn and the hair. I don't know if you remember that with the prodigal son and uh, his, his hair is all matted. But here, the thing about these, except for this fellow, look at these and, and then this person seated, all kind of just leaning toward the money. <laughs> Let me just uh, visibly 
I mean, they're, 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 it's like it's like they're going to um, go scrambling to to uh, each get some of it. Is that the law books there in the? Yeah, I would I would assume. Yeah. And and, uh, and and Judas is, is is he's looking also at the money, but he's but he's he, he's uh, kind of out of out of out of the side of his eye, as it were. But uh, but he's contorted. I think I think he's I think the way that that I don't know how you see this, but the way I see that figure is that he's uh, in 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 some way still wondering if he should have kept the money. That kind of um, Conflicted. Now, this is, uh, of course, that scene that I said is in all four Gospels is uh, uh, Pilate and offering to um, release either Jesus or Barabbas. And this is probably Barabbas here. It looks kind of like a rough character. <laughs> um, and, and this is over here. This woman looking out the window is thought to be a a portrait of Rembrandt's wife. So what that means is, is hard. It's hard to know. Um, she's not in this in the crowd, uh, but she's observing the scene at, at, a, at a distance of some kind. Um, this this is a statue of justice and a statue of mercy, which is obviously ironic in this case because Jesus is getting either justice or mercy. Um, no, notice the this. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little hard to see, but there's a pitcher here and a bowl here. This is reference to a uh, pilot is uh, going to wash his hands of the whole thing, uh, quite literally. <clears throat> wash his hands, which uh, from which we get that expression. He doesn't want any part of this. Uh, notice this figure here because he's he's going to feature in another. Uh, version of the same print. I, I gathered it with the, the or not print etching. So I gather, you know, you, if once you have the copper etching, you can do a variety of things with it, uh, including we'll see in subsequent ones, light and dark. But in, in this case, Rembrandt redoes this. It's essentially the same scene, right? Except here. The people are gone here. And this figure stays. He's the only one. I, I'll go, go back for a second so you can see that. He's the only one who casts a shadow. <laughs> the others don't cast a shadow. It's kind of curious. And he's the only one in a posture of prayer. Um, so the thought, and, and, and this is the later version of this etching. With the people taken out of the foreground here, and some people uh, conjecture as to why is that is that is that when those people are in the foreground, it it, it uh, it's harder for our for us to picture ourselves in the scene than it is in this version. You know, here there's nothing between you and Jesus, where are the others. In the other version, got all those people kind of standing in for us. Um, I don't know. W whatever the reason, Rembrandt thought that was important. He, want, he, he wanted this version. Uh, here's much the same scene in a, a, a painting um, where you have, have Pilate here disputing with the re religious leaders. He, you know, he, do, he doesn't think that uh, Jesus should be executed. The religious leaders are calling for his crucifixion. And there's, you know, again, there's great tension in this group here. And symbol is half the symbol of authority that's Pilate's. Is one of the religious leaders is grabbing, grabbing for it to uh, uh, a questioning Pilate's authority in that, in that very graphic way. This is one we've seen before, if it looks familiar in another session. Uh, this is a, a 
Rembrandt scene when Jesus is uh, and on the cross lifted up. Uh, this is this is probably uh, Joseph of Arimathea, again, a popular or common figure eight for the burial of Jesus. That this 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 kind of diagonal is quite amazing. And the fact that, that Rembrandt put himself so close to the wound, um, quite remarkable. We're gonna see two versions of the same print. Uh, this is kind of obviously the great darkness here that uh, um, emphasizing the darkness of that day. Uh, when when Jesus was crucified, it's just a different, and it's very. And I'm sorry about the quality of this reproduction, but I wanted you to see this. It, this incredible, these rays of light, and in the previous version, the rays of light didn't extend to the to the, the, the person over here. Uh, here, it, it, it illumines everything, the light of the world, um, and even shines on uh, those unfortunate souls who are being crucified with him. Uh, two, I mean, it's amazing to take this one etch and then have version and here's a Rembrandt uh, self-portrait again that we saw in a previous session. Uh, he looks like he's kind of holding on to Jesus' arm I mean, it's, and, and Jesus in this incredible twisted form again. And this is kind of a, the mirror image. Can you see that? Here's a Joseph of Arimathea here again. And he's over here and that. And there's another Rembrandt's self-portrait in this case, he's uh, uh, experiencing, I think it looks like to me like the agony of and this uh, is a uh, version of the matching of the, of, uh, the, the, the previous one that we saw descent of Jesus and and that's the the Rembrandt self-portrait here of course is a very just a uh, simplest lines of the Pieta of the Mother Mary and, and Jesus and it's, it's, it's to the Do you remember seeing uh, that I showed you the nativity where it was incredibly dark and there's just that little light around the Holy Family? Well, here it is incredibly dark again. In this case, it's the entombment of Jesus right uh, in, in this corner, which is more illuminated in another version of this etching here. Now, this is a Rembrandt painting. It's, it's uh, not, not a Holy Week painting, but I wanted to show you this. This is uh, J Jesus and the Raising of Lazarus. And I, and I just want you to look at this figure of Lazarus. He, uh, he's been through a lot and his face <laughs> shows it. And, uh, and here's, here is sisters and just uh, astonished and amazed. And Jesus and the, the blessed that of, of his friend Lazarus um, but but what, what I want you to notice here I mean obviously the raising of Lazarus that story is uh, um, is uh, is is uh, only found in one of the gospels but it, it is a, it prefigures the, the the resurrection of Jesus but it's different 
in that in that Lazarus and, and Rembrandt gets this. Lazarus is like a resuscitated corpse. I mean, he's um, uh, and he's going to die. He's going to die. <laughs> Um, maybe not too long from now, but he, he's, uh, and, and he looks like a resuscitated corpse in this, uh, doesn't, doesn't look good. And how different that is from the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> this is the contrast I wanted to show you. I mean, in this depiction, remember, this is, this is an odd one, I think. He looks kind of jaunty. He's got this hat. <laughs> he's appearing to Mary Magdalene, right? And the, these are the angels who are, uh, but Mary Magdalene is the only human witness. So this is a, a from John and, and uh, the, the spade in his hand is a, Mary Magdalene thought at first it was the gardener and according to the story, but this, uh, <laughs> this is not a corpse. He's looking pretty good here. <laughs> and, uh, and as I say, kind of downright jaunty. Now here, Again, just Mary Magdalene. Jesus has a, a, that doxa, that glory about him, uh, giving that sign of blessing. And yet also, notice, he's, he's kind of, um, well, I think this is, a, this is a depiction of the story where, where he says, don't try to hold me to, to Mary Magdalene. So don't, don't try to hold me. Uh, don't, like hold me back and he's so he's kind of moving away from her a little bit I think in this way de depicted here and 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 in contrast sorry there, there's no there's no and and yet here there's that there's that sign that and 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 I think this is a later painting. I think Rembrandt's coming to that understanding of what I was saying before about Paul seeing a spiritual body, not, not a body like we're used to seeing. Now, this is that wonderful, I love this painting. This is, um, uh, this, and, and Rembrandt loved the story of the road to Emmaus, where Jesus comes alongside these uh, travelers and they don't recognize him, which is another kind of odd thing. They didn't, because they knew him, didn't recognize him. It, it, it's, uh, and, and so is he, uh, is he somehow different and yet the same? Because they, they eventually they come to see who he is. And you may recall this when it's in the, he became known to them in the breaking of the bread. So it's that table and uh, that, that they came to see him, um, perhaps be because that other, but uh, but I love this this depiction of Jesus as a as as a as a figure that you um, don't see head on, and in, as a, and in this case is uh, in, in silhouette, and 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 this this fellow here um, doesn't know what to make of it at first. <laughs> And because this is a shadow that's casting a light. I mean, that's just in itself is kind of a, right? It's usually a light that casts a shadow. But as I, as I see, this is a shadow casting a light. Interesting. Again, Rembrandt's reaching for ways to try to capture the, the, the way scripture or the gospels talk about the resurrected Christ and the, the, the kind of... Uh, This is that same scene that there's the glory seen in Emmaus. Yeah. And here's another one. We're here, Jesus, and that's this kind of a more intimate scene. And then there's that moment when they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And then recall what it says after that, it's that he disappeared from their sight. And here is that moment. I don't know of another artwork that depicts or attempts to depict that moment in the story that, that uh, he uh, disappears from their sight. And 
Any reflections you want to offer? Okay. Um, we have just a few minutes here to do something kind of summative here. here. There are three works that we're going to look at that we've seen before. So I said from the beginning, I, I have found Rembrandt to be such a wonderful companion in reading the Bible and, and uh, for so many ways. Um, and and uh, for instance, this, this one helps me reimagine the scene of Jacob wrestling with... Uh, uh, the angel, or the one they came to know as the angel. Um, in various ways to interpret this, of course, and, and, and Rembrandt um, leaves us on our own to do that. And I think gratefully, because then we can interpret it uh, as we will, just, just as he interpreted scripture out of his own imagination, he invites our imagination to do the same. This uh, uh, First, in our first session, that that Rembrandt was not content to just work with the themes and the images and the stories that were so commonly used in up uh, up till his, his time. There was almost a kind of visual canon of and he ranged much more widely, uh, and he really. I think demonstrated that the Bible was his to engage and interpret and to do so creatively. Um, the, the, the Holy Spirit inspiration is not only how the words got on the page of the Bible, but also how they get off the page and how you imagine it. That's, that's the Holy Spirit is at work in that as well. And he fully um, grasped that. Very, very Protestant in that way, by the way. Uh, it, you know, the, the Bible is is mine to read, and 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 not only to be uh, interpreted by religious authorities, but mine to read as a believer and to draw my own conclusions. Um, I think I mentioned to you that 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 uh, one of you had I thought just a wonderful uh, interpretation of this, and again, it's not the only interpretation, but it's, I think it's a, a wonderful one. Is that that, that it looks like the angel is 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 laying Jacob down to sleep, laying him down, laying him down to rest, uh, as one might a child, as a kind of loving look. But that's that's a uh, that's an interpretation on an interpretation. This is Rembrandt's interpretation, and and invites us and leaves us to make our own interpretations as well. This is one of my favorite paintings of all. Um, this is one of those embedded self-portraits, and here's Rembrandt right in the middle of it, right in the thick of things, between the storm and the calm, between where Jesus is central to where people are just hanging on for dear life, and he puts himself right in the middle, hand slapping his forehead as if to say, how on earth did I get in this place? But I just love the whimsy of that and also the vulnerability of that, and how often, as we saw in our second session, he placed himself in the biblical stories, uh, which is a wonderful way to read the Bible. Where are you in this story? Christianity is not so much a set of beliefs, doctrines, as it is a story, and one in which we're invited to uh, and they're into part end. So where are you in this story? And Rembrandt did that over and over again. He put himself in the story of the crucifixion. He put himself in the story here um, and, uh, and and elsewhere, um, imaginatively engaging the, the biblical story. It's a wonderful question to ask when listening to a Bible passage. Where are you in this story? Who are you or who could you imagine yourself to be in this uh, story? And then last I have a question. Have a yes. question. How, how many people were around in Palestine at this time? And how many of them were affected by 
all of the goings on that we've been seeing. It seems to me that many people there had no idea what was going on and they had no idea who Jesus Christ even was. Yeah, I mean, uh, how, how, he was clearly a, uh, a, a phenomenon uh, and, uh, and had many followers uh, that, uh, I, but I don't know when you say how many, I, I, I don't know how to gauge that, but, uh, and, and, and a lot of the numbers that are used are symbolic, but, you know, the, the idea of the feeding of the 5,000 or the 7,000, which would be a, a, a big crowd in any age, um, <laughs> I, I, I've never preached to a crowd that large, I don't think, but um, 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 but but those are again, those are probably more symbolic numbers. So, Roger, I don't I don't know quite know how to answer that question. But he was clearly a phenomenon, um, a, a public phenomenon, not not just known to a few people. I think that's safe to say. Obviously, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I'm just gonna say pretty obviously on the previous picture, the mast on the ship was certainly reminds one of the cross. Yeah, very good observation. Absolutely, very good observation. Uh, and then this, the head of uh, Christ, as it's called. And I, lo I love this because of the way in which it uh, depicts Jesus and all his uh, humanity, uh, which is so important because um, it, it is a way of, of, of saying that nothing human is strange to God. That's part of the affirmation of, uh, of the uh, uh, incarnation. It is, so just picture, and I didn't make this point in this session. And I just, that a picture that Jesus was an inheritor to a tradition that believe that you could not look at the at the face of God and live and the, the notion of seeing the face of God was so overwhelming that that you, that you would perish like an ice cube thrown at the sun and this idea of and, and then when Jesus was depicted as, as in, in some way the face of God in early Christian art he didn't. He didn't look like a, a person. I mean, it looked like a, like you picture the icons, where he didn't look like the person we would encounter at the marketplace or in our everyday life in other ways. And then along comes Rembrandt and depicts Jesus in this way, in this very human way, with that uh, again in the icons. Jesus always looking forward, as if in two dimensions as if he could take on two dimensions of human life but not a third dimension. And here's Jesus with the tilt of the head and with that expression on his face, reminding us that he was, he was, uh, he was fully human. And because he was fully human, uh, nothing human is strange to God. And he wasn't blonde either. He wasn't blonde either. Yeah. <laughs> Well, dear friends, I uh, went over a couple of minutes. We started a couple of minutes late. Uh, thank you for this time or these times together, which I really appreciated and uh, your input and your interest. And uh, it's, it's good to, uh, to have shared this experience with you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. And something. Thank you. See you in church, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.